Senator Grisanti and uh, Senator Gallivan and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for convening this hearing on a topic that is of urgent concern to all New Yorkers. As we consider whether to permit or prohibit high volume horizontal hydrofracking in our state, it's essential that we understand the fate of the toxic waste that is necessarily generated. Where does it go? Who is exposed? What are the health effects? My name is Sandra Steingraber. I serve as a distinguished scholar in residence at Ithaca College, and my PhD is in biology from the University of Michigan. My field of study is environmental health, and I'm the author of three books on the topic, the most recent of which investigates the impact of fracking on children's health. Last month, I received a Heinz Award for my work on health and the environment. I am devoting the $100,000 prize money to the fight against fracking in New York State and I hope my testimony today will help explain why. Hydraulic fracturing relies on pressure, water, and high volumes of inherently toxic chemicals to shatter the bedrock beneath our feet. Once shattered, the bedrock releases more than just bubbles of gas. The rock itself releases inherently toxic materials that have been bound together with a shale for 400 million years. And this toxic waste from fracking takes three forms. The first are vapors, such as benzene and toluene. Benzene is a known human carcinogen. Toluene is a potent reproductive toxicant with the power to extinguish human pregnancies. Now, I'll return to the issue of reproductive health effects at the close of my remarks. These volatile organic gases also combine with tailpipe uh, exhaust to create smog, and this kind of air pollution is lethal. Exposure to smog is definitively linked to stroke, heart attack, diabetes, and premature death. In children, it is linked to premature birth, asthma, cognitive deficits, and stunted lung development. Last May and again in October, I provided testimony before the New York Assembly on the potential health effects of air pollution created by fracking, and today I'll focus on the liquid wastewater. As with air contaminants, the present technology does not ensure public health, nor does the draft Supplemental Generic Environmental Impact Statement provide a regulatory framework that would compel uh, such technology. Of course, what brings us together today is the sleight of hand legal exemptions that classifies dozens of the chemical constituents used in fracking fluid as hazardous, but spares the flowback fluid from wearing the same label, even though it contains those very chemicals along with a bunch of others. By any definition known to toxicology, wastewater from fracking operations is hazardous. Hydrofracking uh, fluid is, was sprayed in a forest in West Virginia. It defoliated and killed more than half the trees and elevated the sodium and chloride levels of the soil by 50-fold. When spilled on the ground, fracking waste sows barrenness where nothing will grow. Those ancient Roman conquerors who salted the earths of their enemies would be impressed with this. Fracking wastewater is also radioactive. According to the DEC's own findings, flowback waste contains radium-226 at more than 200 times the safe limit for discharge into the environment, more than 3,000 times the safe drinking water standard. And yet the S-Geist does not ensure that this truly hazardous fluid is treated as truly hazardous substance, nor does it attempt to make it less hazardous. The volume of wastewater generated by fracking is immense, and it's really hard to visualize. In the Marcellus Shale, between 4 and 9 million gallons of water required to frack a single well, at least 1 million gallons uh, uh, returned to the surface as wastewater, 62,000 wells are envisioned for New York State. And if all those wells are fracked only once, which is a highly conservative uh, assumption, the total amount of wastewater generated is 62 billion gallons. Now, to visualize that amount of water, consider that 500,000 gallons of water go over both sides of Niagara Falls every second. The amount of wastewater that would be generated in New York State from fracking, if we decide to permit it, is equal to the volume of water cascading over the Niagara Falls for 35 straight hours. So imagine standing in front of the Niagara Falls for 35 hours, and now imagine that all the cascading water that you see is radioactive and full of toxic chemicals, and your job is to figure out where to put it so it won't come into contact with any person or any body of water or the soil or the, or the air forever. And keep in mind that our neighbor, Pennsylvania, is already generating a Niagara Falls worth of wastewater of its own and will be competing with us for storage space. The where to put it question is not adequately addressed in the draft generic environmental impact statement, which does not put forth a comprehensive plan for waste disposal, nor explicitly prohibit fracking waste for entering sewage treatment plants. Deep injection wells are one repository for fracking wastewater, and the nearest ones are in Ohio. 
How much fracking wastewater can be shoved in the underground rock formations of Ohio? One Niagara Falls of wastewater or two? I have not been able to find an answer to this question in the geological literature, and neither can I find it in the Eskice. Certainly, citizen opposition to the important, uh, importation and deep well injection of fracking wastewater in Ohio appears to be growing, especially now that earthquakes are an officially recognized risk of fracking fluid injection. Unlike fracking itself, the creation of injection wells to store the resulting waste is not a jobs creator. As the town councilman of Mansfield, Ohio noted last week, the promise of four or five jobs isn't necessarily worth living with a chemical dump site for hundreds of years. This comment came in response to a no vote by the Mansfield uh, City Council to a Texas company that proposed to drill two injection wells for Pennsylvania-based fracking waste. Meanwhile, in Youngstown, Ohio, seven protesters were recently arrested for blocking trucks at a brine injection site. As one of them explained, we have a responsibility to take a stand. If these companies are poisoning our water and our air, they are the real criminals and not us. Such actions raise another question. Even if the subterranean landscape of Ohio could hold all the toxic waste Pennsylvania and New York can send it, should we in New York State move forward with an energy plan that hinges on the successful transfer of large amounts of hazardous waste to a place where residents are willing to lay their bodies in front of trucks to prevent that transfer? Now, a lot has been said today about uh, filtering and recycling and reusing uh, wastewater. I just want to point out that the laws of thermodynamics still apply here, Newton's law that says matter cannot be created nor destroyed. So although uh, through uh, filtering, re reusing, and recycling, you may actually reduce the volume of water, the mass of all the toxic chemicals that are in the wastewater still remain. They're just more concentrated um, so that when you truck them off and they still need to be disposed of somewhere, um, you have uh, even more uh, poisonous uh, substance. A few weeks ago, a letter was sent to Governor Cuomo from dozens of cancer advocacy organizations in New York State, from Buffalo to Long Island, demanding that a rigorous health impact assessment proceed and inform the decision whether or not to open our state to fracking. I've included a copy of this document in the appendix of my testimony. So I just point out here that the S-Geist does not prohibit the use of cancer-causing chemicals in fracking fluid. The word children does not appear in the S-Geist. Lung cancer from radon exposure is not a topic taken up by the S-Geist, even though radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer responsible for 21,000 cases a year in the U.S. The words breast cancer do not appear in the S-Geist, even though the uh, international... Um, the Institute of Medicine's new report on breast cancer identifies benzene and radiation exposure uh, as two chemical exposures that are, have the strong evidence linking them uh, to breast cancer. A new human rights assessment of hydrofracking recent, uh, was released today by the Environment and Human Rights Advisory, and I've brought a copy for you. It details 26 human rights norms of concern relevant to fracking, ranging from security of person uh, to the right to uh, prior free and informed consent, the report concludes that viewed in the light of human rights standards, these facts may raise liability concerns for the New York State Department of uh, Environmental Conservation. So I'd like to close now by putting a personal face on the human rights issue. In 1979, at the age of 20, I was diagnosed with bladder cancer. My diagnosing physician asked me about my possible exposures to toxic chemicals. I didn't know then that his questions would become my life's work. Years later, I returned to my hometown in Illinois and investigated an alleged cancer cluster there, of which I was one data point. Among other things, I discovered that there were dry cleaning fluids in the presence of the drinking water wells. The underlying geology of the area should not have allowed that to happen, but there it was. I came to appreciate how little we really know about the unmapped landscape below the ground, which has intimate, unseen connections to the world above ground. It's not just an inert lump of rock. Now, at the time of my diagnosis, I was heartened because the newspaper headlines were full of a story, stories about a woman named Lois Gibbs in a place in upstate New York called Love Canal. And I was so impressed that a single woman could organize a community that not only prevented further exposure to toxic waste that had been buried years before, uh, but she was able to actually compel changes in our federal environmental laws to assume that all Americans are protected from such exposures. Fracking literally turns the earth inside out. It turns precious fresh water in the Earth's surface into poison and then buries it in fractured geological strata where it is no longer part of the hydrologic cycle. 
in its place. It brings toxic rocks, heavy metals, poisonous vapors, and radioactive substances and mass amounts of wastewater out of the earth, which then requires permanent containment on the surface of the earth for, for time immemorial. Fracking could easily become Love Canal on an epic scale. And there is nothing in the current Esgeis that indicates the lessons of Love Canal have been remembered and applied. I said I would, I would end with a topic of reproductive health. Uh, this is an emotional topic, so I wanted to put it near the end of my remarks. A lot's been said here about the amount of uh, dissolved solids uh, and uh, sediment that end up in the water. When that water is chlorinated, you end up with disinfection byproducts. I know a lot about these because they're a cause of bladder cancer as well as colon cancer. But when I wa what I want to talk about now is that when, the, when total dissolved solids are chlorinated for drinking water for sewage treatment and you, you produce hundreds of, of these chlorination byproducts, many of these also have the power to interfere with prenatal life and end human pregnancies. In fact, this is even admitted in the Eskice itself, uh, section 6, page 46. Disinfection byproducts have been identified in a number of medical studies as a factor linked to early term miscarriage. I hope this disturbs you as deeply as it disturbs me. The admission that fracking waste generates chemicals that can extinguish pregnancy is deeply distressing. Whether you look at this evidence for harm as I do, as a Planned Parenthood issue, a woman should be able to plan a parenthood and carry it out without other people's chemicals interfering, or from a right to life perspective, as many members of my own very conservative family do, who believe very deeply in the question of fetal sanctity. The question of what the dissolved solids are doing when they're chlorinated and how it might be affecting the prenatal life of women in New York, if it's ending pregnancies and harming fetuses, this is a question that needs to be answered. If we frack New York, are we ending pregnancies and will babies die? I urge you to take this up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra. Do you have any knowledge if um do you have any knowledge that if in Pennsylvania or Texas they've done any impact uh, health statements? Um, there has been some work on health impacts in Texas, um, but none of them were done um, as a prerequisite for permitting fracking. So they were after the fact um, studies. So we know, for example, um, in the areas of uh, the gas patch in Texas um, that we see the transfer of uh, volatile organics into people's indoor airspace, and we can actually measure those chemicals uh, in their blood and urine. Um, we know that some of the symptoms that these people are experiencing, um, numbness, nausea, and so forth, uh, are, are known um, health effects of the particular chemicals that they uh, have been exposed to. There's some emerging data from Texas on breast cancer and fracking showing that women who live um, in the most intensely uh, fracked areas of Texas, their breast cancer incidence rate is actually going up, which is interesting because throughout the U.S., as well as the rest of Texas, breast cancer incidence happily now is on the decline. So these are correlative data. I would not, as a scientist, want to claim that these are definitive proof of anything, but they are certainly clues for further inquiry that we need to pay attention to. Okay. And I I'm, yeah. Okay. I appreciate uh, your testimony today. I don't know if Senator Gillivan has any questions. You. You're welcome. Thank you. You already provided those other things. Yeah. Frank Miller, please. Good afternoon. Okay. Uh, 